Good morning, everybody. Let's see. I am not seeing you. Let's see. Six, eight seconds, nine seconds, ten seconds. No. I am not seeing you. I am live now in Accelerators Organization. There you go. Now I can see you. You are good to go, Marsha. Okay, great. Thank you, Sean. Uh, have fun. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Marsha O'Connor, and I am the CEO and founder of the O'Connor Group. We are based out in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. I'm happy to answer a lot of questions today, so bear with me. Um, it's my first time going live with all of you, so we've got a lot of questions to go over, so bear with me here, guys. Number one. Question was asked by a Peter Rosato. Um, should I hire an outside consultant as a W-2 or a 1099? And what should I take into consideration? Now, he is actually asking this from California. And for those of you who don't know, California is almost like its own country when it comes to human resources. So to be honest with you, I don't know exactly the California law they have with that, and we can definitely find that out for you. But if, um, if I were you, what I would do basically is try to figure out in regards to a 1099 gets sticky. And this person is actually in your office and all and working for you, you can do that. But keep in mind, 1099 gets tricky in regards to basically who's paying the taxes. Now, they're typically supposed to pay the taxes, and you have to make sure they are, but if they're actually working for you and doing a project for you, you know, if they don't pay taxes, you're going to be liable for that. So you'll be very cautious about that. Now, a W-2 is different, too, because not only do you have to pay unemployment, you're going to have employer taxes, and if they fit their benefits and all, too, you can't just say you won't be included. It's an employee. You have to be consistent with everybody. So it's really putting your pros and cons down as to what you want. Now, going back to 1099, you also want to make sure that they have insurance. And insurance is a cost to them as well. So these are things and factors you want to put into play. You also have a liability in there, too. So say, for example, they get hurt there as well. Who's paying for work with compensation? So you really want to make sure that you have pros and cons in there and see whether or not anybody else out there are, are doing um, outsourcing tutors, outsourcing nannies, there's a lot of that going on right now, especially what's happening because everybody's going virtual in the fall. So I hope I help you answer that question. If not, just let me know. Second question we have here is from, and I, I apologize ahead of time if I mess up the last name here, but Gaber Raziz. Um, so I want to say thanks for bringing it to our attention. Should my company pay to get someone trained to fill a role with our company, or should they develop the skills first and then we hire them? Now, typically, this is how I would answer this. Um, with my team, I know the fact that they, most of them have the skills, or if I see the potential and that grit, I'm going to hire them still, and I want to train them. Because you know what? You, it's really hard to find that grit in that individual who is really up to par and up to speed. And so I preferred basically to hire the grit, and then I can train them. And ironically, you want to train them into the ways that you do your business and your culture. And I think that's really important. Yeah, you could definitely wait until they get their training and all too, but you're missing out on probably a really good person that could do a variety of different things. So be careful which, um, what you really want to do. Now, I know in here you said you're a small family-owned business with three owners, um, four full-time and two to three part-time employees plus a ton of contractors. You do keep them lean and all too, and I can appreciate that. But if you have somebody who is perfect, as a culture fit and all too, you really want to make sure that you try to find space for them. Now, what I have also learned is there are wonderful people who fit culture and they're fun and they're warm and they're bubbly. But as a really good business coach once told me, stop trying to basically make the job description fill the person and make sure that you fill the job description and not the person. What that means is basically, I love somebody on my team so much, and this person had so much to offer us, but unfortunately, I needed that job description position filled to really keep things cranking here, and there really wasn't anything else I could put this person in charge of, and so we had to come to a conclusion to basically part ways, and it was very hard, this wonderful person, great attributes, everything, but we really needed to get that job filled. 
So you, you got to be very careful because obviously time is money and money is time, but you only want to make sure it really fits where you want to go and where you want to take it. Um, there's a lot of great people out there too, but you got to keep in mind, a small business has to really focus on the jobs to be successful to moving forward. Okay, so next question we have is from Law Jackson. The question is, are there companies out there that can help me find talent as I grow my company, and if so, how much? Um, so there, there obviously are. And you want to make sure that you have a rapport with, and talk to people. Talk to other entrepreneurs of who they are using and basically where they're finding their individuals. Now, I can tell you, like, my company has a whole different model. And how we do it is basically we provide a lot of recruiting help for a lot of our clients, typically, like, under 100 employees. And how we do it is hourly. There's not a headcount cost. If there's a headcount cost with basically finding people, you want to find out exactly how much that is. And keep in mind, if there is a headcount cost, they make their money of how large that salary they're going to negotiate for you, and they get a percentage of that too. So be very careful. There are other units out there, like we're considered almost like an RPO, a re um, recruiting process organization, but there are smaller units in those too to help you basically fi fill out those positions on your accountability chart to get you to where you need to go. But you start talking to entrepreneurs and figure out who have you used? Did you like him? Did you not like him? Were they fast? Um, were they reputable? Did they take good care of your candidates? Did they follow up with you? Did they understand the job description? Did they understand your culture? These are all the questions you're going to really have to ask. So yes, to answer your question, there are a, a lot of resources out there. It's really going to take a little bit of time to figure out which one's going to really work well with you. And there are two different models, like I said. There is contingent out there. For the higher level, there are retains. And retain basically means you're paying them that fee whether or not they hire somebody. It's a lot of money, but the good ones are worth it because they have the database. They know how to handle pretty high-end individuals. I know too, but if you're just starting out and trying to get some moving, use your employee referrals as well and put an employee referral program together. You know, and that basically helps you hire individuals of individuals that people know and they trust to work with you. And if you make it having like a thousand or two thousand dollars a bonus in there and you make a big deal about it, more and more people are actually going to refer people to you. So that's another avenue you can take besides going outside. Okay? I hope that answered your question. Next question on here. We have a lot of questions today, guys, so bear with us. Um, next one is from Eric Blandino. And the question he asked are, what are strategies we can use in our culture to cross-train our team to do multiple things during downtime? Excellent question. Let me tell you basically what we did. And, you know, it was really helpful. So we are a professional services company, and my team members are all billable. So obviously, when their numbers are down, we were wondering, what are we going to do? Because then they start to panic and worry, am I going to have a job? And I said, we're going to take good care of you, but we're going to split things up. And so we would have questions with them saying, what do you like to do? Sales, marketing, you know, ideas. And a lot of them actually did choose the marketing side. So we had a marketing call with the marketing team. And for a, a few weeks, they actually helped out the marketing team. And they were phenomenal with the ideas that they came out of nowhere. So we really appreciated them basically having these ideas. And then one of the days, we actually, so when, when COVID first hit, um, my team basically put together a 15-minute huddle every single day. And it was really more of a pulse of how we're doing and where we're going and, and what's the business doing and how are we doing this all together. And it really helped us keep us together. But it also showed each other what they were working on, who was doing what, and basically how we could help each other. And it really made it more along the lines of everybody really saying, hey, how can I help you? I have some downtime. Hey, how can I help you? I'm really good in marketing too. And I haven't done it before, but I have some ideas. And we utilized all their time and resources together. And it also empowered them. It empowered them to really feel comfortable with each other and feel as if they were adding value. And we actually had some great ideas from it. So much so that the following week, we took one of those sessions and we made it a full hour. I said, this is going to be innovation hour. So we actually sat there and I, I, read, I wrote down all on Zoom, all their ideas in an hour. I, they came up with 40 ideas. And, you know, it was so awesome to hear some really phenomenal ideas that we were doing. 
So we took five of them to put them in practice, actually. And we used that team, basically, to help us put this in play because they had the downtime. And so, ironically, I think my team now is stronger than ever, but they appreciate each other in what they do. And now I have actually some people in my recruiting team who are now also doing HR. And I have some of my HR people now helping out with marketing and business development. And I would never have known that without basically asking the question, hey, what do you like to do and what else would you want to do? And so these things are basically helping us keep us together, but I also think it's got a, given them a good advantage of how to help each other and how to respect each other and what they bring to the table for the company. So these are just a few ideas that I would suggest, uh, but definitely cross-training is a really important thing to do. Um, I do also believe in the fall you're going to see a lot more people potentially leaving your company, and you want to make sure you have succession planning lined up as well as an understanding about what each other person is doing. So we do um, a backups um, in my recruiting team. So typically I'll put two of my consultants on like one project. And the idea behind that is that if someone does leave, that the client isn't left blinded and that we actually have somebody else already knows the culture and what they're doing. So these are just some ideas and tips for you. So I hope that answers that question too. Um, next question is from Lindsay Grifka. What are certain current strategies I can use to promote my brand and me as an authority expert to grow my business. Well, um, and I understand the business that you're in and all too. So here's something that I would highly recommend. There is so much free social media ideas out there right now. And it takes a little bit of time and effort. And I know when you're the owner, you, you can't do it all. And I highly suggest you don't do it all. Um, you'll never move ahead. But you know, you might want to talk about hiring even a college intern right now. A lot of them are remote this fall. A lot of them are looking for other things to do. A lot of them don't want to go to an office. So what greater opportunity right now is that basically asking colleges in your area if you could post a position for some, like a social media manager to help you get the word out there and to put together a marketing plan. Because they're actually, if that's their major, why not take advantage right now of using these resources to help you? Um, one of the ways we've been doing that and getting the word out there is actually we have a database. We, we spend money on HubSpot, and I actually have an amazing um, marketing director who did a phenomenal job, especially during COVID, of just getting out there per week all the messages and all the things that we were doing to help all of our clients and our cl friends of the firm. And to be honest with you, one of our goals was actually increasing our LinkedIn followers. And so we actually put like a contest out there of saying, hey, you know, my team is looking to promote us on follow. Can you follow us? And so from the beginning of March until now, we've actually increased over 4,000 followers. And it's because we just asked for it out there. And so it doesn't have to be that complicated and that hard, but also be a subject matter expert out there. So one of the things we started to do was um, ask open um, office hours. So every Thursday during COVID, well, the past five months basically, every week my HR team, I've had two senior consultants, basically offer free HR advice to our clients and friends of the firm for a full hour. And we would typically get 30 to 40 people on those calls, but it was very helpful basically for them to see that we were helping them out there. We weren't charging them. We were getting our, our information out there. And to be honest with you, a lot of people became um, friends of the firm and many marketers for us and had basically refer us a lot of people and a lot of work out there. And we were just really trying to help, but it, it actually, it, it really um, helped us greatly in regards to the followers and our marketing out there. And people constantly say to us, oh my God, this is great. Another thing that we did is we put together, when everything first started, we actually had the idea of, of a thing called survival guide. And it was the top 10 survival tips per week um, that we wanted to help other people just to figure out how to get things done and what does this paperwork mean and what does FFCRA mean and what does this mean? And it, ironically enough, it exploded in population. So we started with 6,000 people in our database for HubSpot and now we have over 9,000 members and it all be is because of this newsletter that we did weekly. And it was really just sharing other information out there but putting it in a way where it was very motivational and caring and thoughtful. And now we actually call it the Thrive Guide. And the Thrive Guide has given us a lot of visibility too, but again, the main purpose behind it was just to help others. And it basically has helped us considerably in regards to social media, 
our followers, our HubSpot followers, and all to you. And you know, while we're getting calls around the country for our services, which is, I guess, the name of the game, but the idea behind it wasn't for that. It was really helping. So there's a lot of ways of social media you can get out there, but you got to be consistent, and you have to show compassion, and basically you have to follow up. So make sure it's not just on the CEO because it's a lot of work for the CEO to do. So try to find somebody who can help you out with that. And it's really good experience too for a college kid, by the way, because they actually are much more technically savvy than we are. And I think it's also the way to get your name out there on a positive side. So I hope that helps answer your question too. These are some of the tips that we did. And we have another question here, and this is from James Giglio. Um, question is, if my company requires employees to travel during COVID times, should we require waivers? What other things would you take in consideration? Um, so here's what we do. Um, so I wouldn't say, it, people are all over the, over the map with this one. And so sometimes they require waivers, sometimes they don't. But what we do, so we have an HRIS system called Paylocity. And there's a lot of HRIS HRIS is Human Resource Information Systems. It's where all of our people information um, basically goes to. And so what we do when we have Paylocity, even people coming into the office where I'm at right now, is we have to fill out a survey to basically let um, other people know we don't have a temperature, we haven't been around somebody else that has COVID, we haven't been out of state, you know, this is how we're feeling today, blah, blah, blah. And that goes into our personal folder. And that really protects the company just to make sure that, you know, that we did our due diligence and we followed our COVID blueprint. It's very, very important. Now, when you're traveling on all two, you want to make sure that, you know, they too are filling out that form and saying, hey, this is where I'm at today. This is how I'm feeling on all two. Whenever they're doing work for you, you want to make sure that survey is completed before they start their day. And I think it's difficult, obviously, to do your own um, thermal. I know a lot of companies and um, clients of mine are actually doing a thermal, you know, gun to their heads and they'll too. And either you can drive and park today or you're going to turn around and go home if you have a certain temperature. That's hard to do when you have people that you really don't know where they're at that day. So you want to make sure they fill out and complete that survey. And make sure they do it every morning before they leave. This way it also will protect you. It'll protect them too because if they're not feeling well and they feel like they have to th get things done, that they will second guess or a second think as to whether or not they should be working that day, okay? So again, you, the tough part is making sure that they actually do it to protect you, and you really wanna make sure that they do. Now, we also make them fill out this survey, my guys, because of the fact that they go to a client, we still make them fill it out, even though that client might have their own um, record and all too, but I'll be honest with you, we're finding out a lot of them do not. And when you don't do that, you're putting your own company at risk and all too, because you know we have in, people are starting to get back to work and it's slowly happening and all too, but it is happening. You just want to protect yourself. You just want to protect your employees to make sure that you did your due diligence to make sure that somebody was protected and this person makes sure this. You want to make sure that there's some kind of documentation in there. So that's how you would do it. It's hard to track sometimes, but if you have somebody that you assign in your company as to hey, if this person's out, make sure they have this in the survey. Make sure that you assign somebody. Like I assigned my executive system to be, be in charge of that. And, um, and right now it's working. And I have 30 people, but we don't have too many people traveling to clients right now. We have a few. But we really make sure that they do fill out this survey. It takes like, not even a minute to complete. Okay? I hope that answers your question. Um, next question <clears throat> is from Adam Drake. And what is a good service app that can handle compliance, payroll, reporting, and everything related to W-2 hire for reasonable costs? Or is this overkill for less than five employees? And should my bookkeeper CPA be handled, handle this? Well, so, hmm, interesting. So I think it really depends of how much that your, your bookkeeper understands, like the HR policies and procedures and laws. There's so many going on right now. And with COVID, COVID has created a whole new book of HR policies and procedures and known compliance. So as long as they're fully aware of all those, you can rest assured be okay with your bookkeeper. But honestly, what I would do at my company when I first had started, um, I started using an outside service basically. And so we started using Bamboo HR first. And Bamboo HR was phenomenal, but it didn't do payroll. And then my payroll company was phenomenal, but it didn't do the tech side of the house. 
So then we decided to move um, our HRIS system and our payroll into Paylocity, which does a phenomenal job for us. Like I say, we're only 30 people. But ironically, I feel as if everything is in there, everything is up to par. Handbooks are updated in there too. All that information is in there. But when you're first starting out, you also might want to consider a PEO. And a PEO basically is a bunch of them out there, and Sperity is one of them. Um, it's one of the most cost-efficient ways of handling all these pieces for you, including benefits on Law 2. And a PEO is going to give you a monthly service charge on Law 2, but it depends upon if you want to stay less than five employees for a while, a PEO is a wonderful option. If you're going to be higher than that and you want to be like 20 employees, I would invest more into an HRIS system that you own basically versus a PEO because eventually you're going to have to move all that information over into your HRIS system anyway. So if you're on that growth mode, I would highly recommend looking into either uh, a Bamboo HR or an HRIS. There's also Paycor, Paycom. There's so many of them out there on the market right now, but it really depends upon where you decide to go down the road. Okay, so again, I hope that answers your question. And, but make sure when you do that, um, so when we did that, we actually had a lot of them come in and do um, a, a, a review of all the pros and all the cons. And then we put together our own spreadsheet as to what we liked about it, what we didn't like about it, what we needed in Law 2. And the nice thing about Paylocity for us is we have um, employee evaluations on their module. We have a training development module on there. Our benefits are on there. And we're probably also going to move our 401k on there too. So this way, everybody can just go into their phone. Um, they can fill out their survey to come in for COVID-related reasons. They could see what their paycheck was. They could see how much PTO they have. They can see their benefits all in one spot. And since we, be, we want to become more national, we really wanted to make sure we had a tool to make sure that they could actually have access to all their information just at the tip of their, their phone, okay? So, and I have another question here in all two. Um, from actually Sean. So thank you, Sean. So Marcia, at what point should a startup entrepreneur develop a relationship with an outsourced HR firm? Um, honestly, um, be honest with you from day one, you know, they're going to give you a lot of insight and a lot of perspective. And I can tell you a lot of times, you know, I just have conversations with a lot of our clients just to talk about where they're going, what they're doing and how big they want to become. And to make sure, did you think about this? Did you think about these laws, these regulations and all too? You really want to have somebody by your side that you can just tap into, even though you're not ready to use them. And there's so there's a lot of us out there. Just make sure somebody really, um, to me, I think you would like to have somebody that had more of a technology side of the house as well as understanding how business works. And I think that's really important. I have a unique background. I, have, I, I went to accounting for school and I have an MIS minor. And... So I really understand the whole business side of the house, but I also have the, the HR and the recruiting strategy behind me too. So I love talking to CEOs and figuring out where do you want to take this company? What do you want to do? Like how much, how much larger do you want to become? And what are the pieces to the puzzle? And you know, typically it's having these conversations with individuals of where you want to go. I would also highly suggest, you know, it's, it's a great staff that you're already part of accelerator organization. That's, that's a huge staff. And there's other groups that you want to be a part of, you know, um, your chambers of commerce, entrepreneurs organization, you know, people like that already have those goombas that they talk to and they feel comfortable with. But I would say if you're going to work with an HR consulting company, have one that has been out there for a little bit, has one that basically knows what they're talking about and really has helped them guide certain clients to get them to their certain levels and how, you know, you want to get examples of it too and say, what exactly did you do and how long did it take? And what are some of the things you recommended? These are really important things that I think a lot of times people forget to ask because lots of times they go to an HR consulting firm just because they need an HR person to do a handbook or a review or they want to get rid of somebody, you know, and there's so much more you can get out of your HR consulting firms, guys. And then once you get to them really, really closely, they're almost like, um, your backhand, you know, it's a, you have lawyer in one hand, you have your HR consultant in the other hand. And I think it's really important that you feel very comfortable that you have a trust factor there and you know what they're doing. I can tell you I've taken calls on a Saturday morning and really just walked people through about what they need and what they, what they think they need. And, you know, I had one conversation before where somebody had called me on a Saturday morning 
and I could tell he was in a panic and he was having issues with his COO and the CEO came on board. It was a little testy because there was like a relationship, not with the COO, but basically the COO's husband was the CEO's best friend. And it, it got a little sticky. And ironically, as soon as this person got into the COO, the VP of sales left, and then all of a sudden the sales team started to leave and all too. And, you know, we had to have these communications as to, are you going to lose your whole staff or, you know, are you, do you have the right person in play? And most of the time it's really, they don't have the right people in the right seats. And so we walk through them and with them, basically, who do you have and why do you have them and what's the purpose here and all too. And a lot of times, I hate to say this, a lot of entrepreneurs will hold on to people um, for the wrong reasons. And unfortunately, you have to keep in mind, this is not personal, this is business. And if you're going to really move to that next level, you got to have the right people in the right seats. So I'm a big believer on that. So to answer your question, Sean, I think you should start from day one um, and have them in your back pocket so that they can help you grow that company to where you want to go. Because most people are not experts in that area. So I hope that helps out a lot with that and to see what happens. But I um, hope that answered your question, Sean. And that's all the questions that we have today. So I appreciate the time today. Feel free to reach out to me um, on Facebook or, you know, I'm always ready to answer a question here and there. And um, you guys have a great day. Stay safe out there. And don't forget, everybody should have a COVID handbook and a blueprint out there. And um, just uh, keep the chins up and we're going to get through this. Take care. Bye-bye.